Hello, and welcome to the Canadian Wargamer Podcast. Yes, it's the Canadian Wargamer podcast featuring two affable and youngish granddads, Mike and James, talking about primarily miniature war games and the occasional hex and counter excursion from Mike from our unique perspective in the Great White North. And as the strains of La Foy d'Arabla die away, here are your hosts, Mike and James. Hey folks, welcome to episode uh, 22 of the Canadian Wargamer podcast. I'm Mike. And I'm James. And uh, we're joined tonight, uh, yeah, and we're joined tonight by Mark. Bonjour, Mark. Salut, Mark. <laughs> so we're joined all tonight. All French, I know. Sorry. All <laughs> French. It's tout le français que nous savons. We are joined tonight by uh, Mark Rodrigue. Uh, did I say that right, Mark? Rodrigue? Uh, yeah, you say like uh, Rodriguez, but uh, without a Z. So it's Rodrigue. Oh, I like you lost your breath in the middle. Okay. Um, and we're excited to have Mark because it's not always that we speak to an award-winning uh, board game uh, designer. And uh, Mark, of course, is the designer of a game that I have uh, talked about on the podcast a few times, uh, Bayonets and Tomahawks, um, about the French and Indian War. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about Mark's career and... Uh, uh, his other interests, which include historical wargaming, we're going to talk about the French and Indian War, and um, we're going to ask Mark uh, uh, what it means to him to be a, a Canadian wargamer. So that's sort of the conversation for the next for the next half an hour or so. So, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Tell us about yourself as a wargamer. What's your your wargaming autobiography? Uh, I I played a lot of Risk with my father. And uh, it led me afterwards to uh, my uh, very first war game, which was uh, a very heavy duty war game because uh, I love tanks, World War II tanks. It was uh, named uh, Panzer by uh, Yak Yakinto Publishing. Oh, uh, yeah, where you had a separate counter for the turret? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that you was know. like and insane. Every nuts and bolts were <laughs> represented. Very, very crunchy. Uh, yeah, it was crazy. We spent uh, nights uh, without sleep playing that <laughs> uh, because it was uh, order plotting every move. So oh it, goodness, it, yeah. yeah. So uh, so that that was my very first war game be because wow. I love tanks. Yeah. And uh, afterward, uh, I simplified my life, or I thought, <laughs> by uh, switching to squad leader. Okay. <laughs> but, but, but the basic, not the advanced. But then I wanted more, and yes. I went to advanced squad leader, and I, I uh, did a burnout of that game. Uh, yeah. Too, too many rules. Uh, I, I, oh still, God, yeah. I still have the encyclopedia of the rules. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Mark, how far did you get in the the squad leader expansions? How many How many of them did you play? Oh, uh, I bought I bought them all. Uh, well, the basic uh, I bought uh, all four because yeah. uh, I'm half French. Uh, my mother is uh, French, so from France. So uh, I absolutely wanted the the French of uh, 1940. Uh, oh, with yeah. the Char B and uh, mm -hmm. and the Soma and the oh, the oh. Soma is such a sexy tank. It's a sexy tank, but not if you're the commander in the turret doing uh, <laughs> the job of three men. Overworked. <laughs> you're an overworked, sexy tank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, it, it looks like uh, what I do in my business. I do everything. <laughs> <laughs> so you can relate. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can relate. I, I think I got as far as the GI Anvil of Victory before I gave up on Squad Leader. It was just too much work. Okay, yeah, yeah. that that was the one that led to the Advanced Squad Leader that 
put everything together and it yeah. was more streamlined right so right speak. <laughs> more streamlined squad leader that, yeah. that's, like, that's like fast play empire i think uh, yeah <laughs> or uh worry free taxes <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly it's a bit of an oxymoron yeah i remember playing squad leader back in the 80s yeah yeah it, it was an amazing game though in its day i mean it, it had so many clever rules about morale and uh opportunity fire and i mean it really was in many ways i think a great miniatures game only it was just in cardboard and yeah. a, lot of people, a lot of people did did convert it to miniatures yeah i remember seeing articles in wargamers digest about that yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah and uh and after a while, I uh, well, I had kids, I had the business, and mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't spend more than uh, an evening gaming uh, once in a while. So I didn't want any more uh, complicated games. Uh, it had to fit in uh, one evening. And then yeah. I met uh, uh, Quebec 1759 by Columbia. Oh, what a great it's, game. It's a masterpiece. It's yes. a masterpiece yeah uh, they're, they're, my, the wooden, they're the wooden block games yeah yeah, yeah. i've got the waterloo yeah. i've got the waterloo game yeah yeah it was the second one in the lineup yeah uh, so i was obsessed with block games for a while then uh axis analyze but not the basic one it was uh, too vanilla for me uh i i bought the axis analyze europe you started to have some uh, more realism Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay. <clears throat> yeah and then uh, uh well i love quebec 1759 so much that i wanted to make to make it about the whole french and indian war mm -hmm. and uh, that was the great grandfather of bayonets and tomahawks in oh. the back in uh, 1992 yeah um, and then I made it a more classic war game with uh, CR combat result tables for those who don't know CRT acronym. Uh, very classic with uh, values on each uh, unit. And, uh, and I was about to self-publish it, uh, being a graphic designer helps. But uh, thankfully, uh, Volko uh, published uh, Wilderness War. And yes. when I saw that box, I said, okay, uh, he, he got it all. <laughs> it's oh. no use for me to, to continue. Yeah, so just, sorry, just for our listeners who um, don't know that name, uh, Volko, Volko Runka. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who's a, uh, he's a Canadian, I believe, right? No, he's uh, an American. Oh, that's right, right. I'm thinking of Brian Virginia. Train. Yeah, Brian Train is the Canadian. Yeah. 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 But Volko and Brian, between them, are sort of the fathers of the the coin, the counterinsurgency games that um, are published by uh, by GMT Games. Yeah, Brian is Canadian. He's in uh, right. Victoria. Yeah, we'd love to get him on the show at some time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Wilderness War came out in 2015, I think, right? Uh, no. Or, oh no, 2001 originally. 2001, yeah, yeah, yeah 2001. So uh, you'd, been, you'd been working on your game for like nine years well on and off and uh, many different directions so it, it, it wasn't the same game each time just right. same, same map design. yeah and uh, but but that still that's crazy and uh, finally I, I put it to rest and then in 2008 uh, I, I, I was uh, visiting upstate New York uh, with my girlfriend, and uh, I heard there was a somewhat big reenactment at Ticonderoga right. taking place, right. but I I didn't realize how big it was. The 250th anniversary, there there were maybe 2,000 reenactors wow. uh, from both camps. It, it was enormous, uh, and when I saw that, uh, uh, two things I, I wanted to. Uh, to be a reenactor, mm -hmm. the uh, next uh, I uh, I, uh, I wanted to dust off my uh, my game design, 
And boy, uh, <laughs> I, I did not realize what, what I was in for because uh, uh, I worked and worked and worked on and off until uh, 2013. Right. Just to throw everything out at one point because it was too long, too complicated, too realistic. Again, designers. Sometimes you got to do that, though. Hmm? Sometimes you got to do that, though. You know, yeah, you, yeah. It you was the, like, the, you know. Uh, it was the best thing that uh, happened to me. So, uh, and then in October 2013, that, that's where Bayonet and Tomahawk is born. Uh, I wanted something really streamlined, uh, no number of values at all, no counting, and something that would uh, make you live the con conflict uh, simply, but uh, very realistically. Mm -hmm. um, now that it's finished, I I failed somewhat in my in my in my dream of a very accessible game because it still it, it still has lots of meat, but I think you cannot go below a minimum in that kind of game. Uh, yeah. You have a seventeen fifty four conquest. By, uh, by a Canadian from uh, Toronto, by Academy Games. Okay. A very good product. I, I'm but, just going to turn on that because I don't know that. Yeah, 1754 Conquest. Uh, uh, it, it's the brother of uh, 1755 uh, Rebellion, which is about the American Revolution. And it's a really cool system. Okay. But uh, a bit too vanilla to uh that's the right expression when you say yeah. vanilla yeah. yeah no and that is, and that is the that is the problem you know you're trying to get something that's streamlined easily for people to get into is um accessible but yeah mm -hmm. you start losing all the crunchy detail that the you know people that are right into the period want to see yeah you know? yeah, yeah. So, um, Mark, one of the things I really admire about Bayonets and Tomahawks is, is how many levels that the game works on, right? Because you have, I mean, it, it's a grand st strategy game. So you, you've got um, pretty much every kind of unit you know, from, from ships and regular infantry uh, down to like Indian bands. Mm -hmm. And the game works on a number of different levels. You've got a, a, a game of raiding, you have uh, sea movement, you have land movement, you've got, you know, logistics. Um, so like, I, one of, that's one of the things I really admire about it is, is how it works on all those different levels. And it gives you a pretty good, um, like it, it sketches out the challenges, right? Like, a, like one of the first things I always want to do when I'm a British player is well, I want to take Louisburg, right? Well, that's yeah. hard. <laughs> like taking you Louisburg- You have to be ready. Taking Quebec is really hard. Mm -hmm. And- and then you discover, okay, I'm going to slog through the wilderness. And then you discover how hard that is, right? You know, so it's, it's, and then you discover, you find a fort and you realize, well, I don't have any artillery, so I can't fight the fort mm -hmm. and I'm stuck. So yeah, it's, it's a very, very clever game. When did, when did you decide to put cards into it? This was a very late, uh, it came late in the design because, uh, uh, Volko uh, was kind of the godfather for my game at uh, GMT because mm -hmm. I met him in Montreal. He was coming to Montreal and he was saying, I want to try Bayonets and Tomahawks. He was saying that to everyone. Right. Yeah, was the, the, and, the, and then we played and I was uh, stressed as hell. <laughs> <laughs> And he was, a, he's a very, very uh, cool, sensitive uh, uh, guy. And uh, sensitive, is it the right word? I, I mean, he's uh, very respectful and open-minded. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and so he loved it. And then he said, uh, well, uh, who's going to publish it? And I said, not GMT, because you're already there. And he, it was his third printing or fourth printing of the game. It's yeah. the classic on the period. Yes. Yeah. A, a bit more, 
level more complicated than uh, my, my design. Yeah. But he loved it and he said, uh, you know how many games about Normandy or Battle of the Bulge we have, so <laughs> I'll introduce you. Good so, point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so uh, I got in and uh, I wanted so much to distinguish myself from Volko's game uh, that I did not want to have cards. So I had, uh, they were called uh, uh, action tokens. Yeah. They, they served the same function as the card, but they were just tokens. They looked like dominoes. Mm -hmm. And in every convention, people were looking and eh, you're going to have cards, I hope. And I said, no, no, no. <laughs> and finally, uh, uh, I made the move and I asked GMT and this is a little miracle because the pricing was already done. And yeah. one of the main guys at GMT, Andy, he said, no way we can squeeze cards. And then uh, Tony, the, the, the guy of production, I, I think he liked me and he said, okay, we, we'll have cards. So that's how cards came uh, in, in the game. But there were already kind of there because the, the tokens did the same thing. They were just uh, harder to read. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the tokens, I couldn't put events. So when I put cards, I could put events. And then it was a, a party of uh, research. So, so many good stories of the French in the war could yeah. put in, uh, in, in the game that way. Okay. Yeah. I think cards would have a lower production cost than uh, like a plastic token. Well, they, they would have been uh, cardboard. Uh, oh, or, yeah, just they, card, they're cardboard still, they're still with printing, like the yeah. printing stock. So mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, but 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 it was much uh, larger because uh, maybe one one token one token was uh, a fifth uh, of a card's surface. So it, oh, it still so you, meant more printing for, for them. Right, so you could get all your tokens on a one or two sheets, whereas yeah, the cards yeah. are printing 10 sheets. Mm. Okay. So, so that was the first uh, good surprise in uh, production. No, yeah. that's good. The other one was the molded dice. Uh, mm. uh, at the beginning, I was told I would get sticker dice, and uh, yes. I was so... Uh, so appalled by that but uh finally people told me the important thing is the cards the mountain board the the dice we don't care and finally i got molded dice so uh, that was another uh, yeah yeah i have uh i right on the far side of my computer i have a, a, a one of the command and colors napoleonics game set up which has mm -hmm. this. yeah i i love the molded dice they're much they're very attractive. I have to say too that the game is really physically very attractive. The map is beautiful. Um, the counters are 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 you know little works of art in themselves. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's just a beautiful looking game. Did you have some input into the graphic side of it? Well, uh, I, I did all the graphics. Uh, that oh. that's the that's something that's great with GMT games uh, that you don't have necessarily with other publishers. If you're a graphic designer, they they allow you to to make your own design the design of your own components. You still have art direction from. Uh, from Mark Simonich, uh, right. Roger yeah. McGowan, but uh, I, I wanted to get wow. that feeling and I was so glad that no other designer came in the way. Yeah, uh, that, that, that was very unique. Yeah, and those are two famous names, like, oh my goodness, like working with Roger McGowan as a graphics guy, that must have been a thrill. Yeah. Well, actually, I uh, we didn't get to work together because uh, he wanted to do the art for the box, mm -hmm. but then he left GMT. Right. And, uh, by by the time my game was ready, so yes. I, I I did uh, my box design, but uh, but yeah, Roger McGowan is a, is an icon of the industry. He did he did the cover 
for Panzer, the yes. my first yeah. war game. Yeah. Uh, and he's, uh, I think, his cover for uh, Crescendo of Doom, the, the, the second module of. Okay. It, it's just marvelous with that British guy. Uh, yeah, yeah. And he has that great word. Yeah. I'd, I'd paint it on my wall, except I'd make a Canadian patch. Yeah. <laughs> Fusilier Mont Royal. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to tell you something that I, I've noticed when I, I played the game twice, and I've only played it solitaire, so I'd love to play it with a real opponent because the game has some really clever mechanics where you can reserve one of your actions to play after your opponent starts and you decide like there's different degrees of initiative. So, um, but I, I always find myself wanting the French to win just because it's one of those games that I think really appeals. If, if you like the underdog, if you like the, because the French, it's kind of a cool side to play. It's they're it's very agile. They have lots of, you know, they, they, the, the British have the big regiments and the brigades of the regulars and all the American colonials. And sometimes with the French, you feel like, you know, I've, I've got like a couple of regiments of white coats, a bunch of Indians, some settlers, and that's it, right? Yeah, but it's, yeah. it's a fun game to play as the French. It's not one-sided, I don't think. No, no. I, I, I like to play both sides. Uh, yeah. When I play the British, I... I work so hard to win because uh, it's really not easy. You you have to place yeah. everything right, unless you play the full campaign. The full campaign is punishing for the French. Yes, I've never done. Uh, it. But uh, the game, as, as I like short game, my game was intended to play uh, one year scenarios, two year scenarios. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I, I squeezed the campaign because I knew that people would make a revolution if I didn't put it in. But uh, but uh, individual scenarios, uh, you you really have to think about what what you're doing as as the British. Yeah, you you also did some something that I really admire, which is giving the um, the First Nations tribes their own proper names. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you were really respectful. Like you, if if I wanted to learn about First Nations history in that war, it would be a the game would be a good place to start. Some of your notes are really are are really helpful there too. So, yeah, I admired that about the game. Um, do, do you know what? Have you ever talked to anybody who's tried to use the game to generate like tabletop battles? Because it seems to me if you had the miniatures. You know the, the the number of units per side is pretty small, right? Mm -hmm. so like if you actually got to a point where you've got a fight, you could put them on the table if you had the miniatures to do it. Do you know anybody who's done that? Yeah, uh, there was one of the playtester. I think he's in the Ottawa region, mm -hmm. uh, and he had the uh, he he does wargaming with uh, John Jenkins figures. You must know that. Uh, John Jenkins miniatures. They're yep. they're one one thirty scale. These are the very oh, best okay, miniatures those. of the French and Indian War. But they're big, so you can do a skirmish with them. But I think he used one figure for each uh, for each regiment or something like that. And he had the <clears throat> landscape and everything. Uh, so James, uh, you, you you must relate because I I uh, I read that you're an avid uh, miniature player. Yes, I'm afraid. Like I started out with board games, and you know, just like this is back in the '70s, you know, and it's like little tiny half inch counters with you know a NATO symbol and a bunch of numbers. Oh yeah, yeah. It's okay. kind of lost me. Yeah. You know? Whereas once I got into <clears throat> miniatures, it's just like you know the the creativity, the artist the artistry, and everything. And I don't know, it's, and it, it, it's easily, you know, to me, it's more easily scalable, right? It's yeah. like, you know, I can spend 20 bucks and buy like a box of figures or whatever and add that to what mm -hmm. I've got. Whereas I have to spend $80 on this game. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Which it's yeah. now a new game that I have to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that, is, <laughs> that is my, that is my threshold with, with board games. Mm. You know, yeah, like they, some of them look great you know but it's like 
it's another set of rules I have to learn. Whereas, you know, I can thirty pages if you, <laughs> yeah, less if you're lucky. And <laughs> yeah, and, and and you know, my last experience was squad leader, so you know. <laughs> hmm. Do you know uh, there was a very good uh, military figure shop in Toronto on Annette Street? I don't trust have... swords. Trust yeah. swords. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I went there several times. I yeah, I bought I bought small uh, French and British figures. Uh, I I painted two or three of them. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've spent a few bucks in at Cross Swords. Yeah, yeah it was a cool shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. still selling off his stock. Oh. Okay. Yeah, and he comes he comes to Hot Lead and he has a booth. And he brings more stuff out of his garage and sells it, and you know. Oh wow! Yeah, he has <laughs> a store in years. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I guess it's really a question of how we want to spend our time, right? Like I, yeah, I, I admire James because James just does miniatures now, and he paints quickly and and to a good standard. Whereas I have a foot in both board games and a foot in miniatures, so I, I just feel like I don't really go anywhere, but. Uh, so, but you also do all that normal stuff like going yeah. you know watching sports events and going out and doing normal social yeah. things yeah that's true and, you know yeah i don't mm. there, there are people there <laughs> nick. Hey, mark i had a question for you about reenacting um in, could you so you reenact french and indian war right yeah because I, I and i think you do um uh you belong to a group that does um uh french marine infantry is that right french de marine yes french marine right okay yeah so tell us a little bit about that tell us how active are you what you know what um what sort of of gear do you have and and, and what have you learned from reenacting uh wow this is a uh, we, we we could spend half an hour but uh uh on just on that but uh, i'm very lucky because the group i met uh, they're very serious in their research uh, if they have a doubt about something they don't use it uh, some of them uh, work at uh, parks canada mm -hmm. uh, we've had some contracts with historic sites so as a French uh, marine uh, reenactor, uh, we're the colonial troops, and we have uh, two two kits of gear. So we have the petite guerre, uh, which is the guerrilla uh, uh, equipment, and it's very uh, light, uh, just. Uh, uh, shirt, uh, the, 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 the coat, sleeve coat, mm -hmm. uh, not the big coat, uh, the, the, the tuck, the, uh, the fatigue cap, mm -hmm. like stocking cap, fatigue cap. No, this one is, uh, it, it, it's one of, uh, the myths about, uh, about French troops here, uh, uh, only regular regiment had them, the, the fatigue caps, they, they, they okay. called them. Uh, so we have the, the knitted, uh, wool knitted caps, red. Oh, oh okay. And, yeah. A toque. The toque, yeah, yeah, a toque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and we, um, below the shirt, we have uh, like, uh, like uh, indigenous people, just uh, a piece of cloth be between our legs and uh, something uh, to cover our legs. Uh, we call that mitas in French, but it's, uh, what's the name? Uh, I, I, it, it's a bit like gaiters, but it's just right. wool. It's just wool uh, and it, it, protects, uh, it, it protects your leg. Right. And uh, right. as footwear, we have, uh, we have, uh, well, in French, it's beef shoes, but they, they, it's moccasins, uh, basically. Right. So that's the, and as weapon, we have the, 
the little axe, the, the cast head, the tomahawk, and uh, of course the, the musket. And um, on the other hand, the, we call that the, the big gear. Uh, in French, it's a grand habillement, the, 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 the great uh, clothing. Mm -hmm. And then we're dressed like regulars from France. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what's fun is that we can have uh, a lot more variety of uh, scenarios than people who do regular troops. Because people who do regular troops they're always in line, always firing in front of each other and listening to the drill. But uh, so we do that sometimes and it's cool. We did it uh, last uh, September, uh, just before 13 September. I, I was at Plains of Abraham. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it, it was magical uh, being there. Mm -hmm. I, I think we were 40 French soldiers. Uh, and we have just a few grenadiers from Nova Scotia who came, but they were great. They had a, a great equipment. Um, and on the other hand, when we dress in a uh, guerrilla style, uh, then it, we can go into more war games, skirmishes, and uh, it, 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 it's really more fun. But both are fun. I, I, I love it. So I, I've been doing that since uh, 2009. And uh, I stopped in 2014 uh, because I was too involved in my game. And uh, then I, I just uh, started again uh, last, uh, last summer. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So in, in muskets and bayonets and tomahawks, sorry, I said I get to- Dave, no problem. And it's, 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 an, it's an actual game. Must, yeah, I know, I know. It's, it's, yeah. As you said, there's only so many names going around, right? <laughs> so in that game, there's like there's light troops versus light troops and regular troops versus regular troops. And they can't really hurt each other, right? Like it's, um, d d is that something that came out of your reenacting? Because you've described two different ways of war in reenacting, like guerrilla fighting, like uh, Indian fighting versus uh, continental fighting, European. Yeah. Well, well, the uh, they relate it. it it's really uh, the game is really about uh, combined arms, right? Because uh, as light troops against regular troops, <clears throat> you still can because we're at uh, an operational strategic yeah. level. Yeah. Uh, you you still can defeat them. Right, right. Uh, not, not that you killed them, but uh, you outmaneuver them. Uh, they, they believe they were cut off. They were demoralized. If you remember uh, the Ticonderoga battle, they, they were like uh, uh, ten or um, that's me now. My memory is uh, is going, but they were like uh, ten. 10,000 10, British against uh, two, 3,000 French or 15,000, yeah, something like that. And they were defeated at the first shock, the British, because they, they, uh, they, their morale was gone. And yes. so, yeah. so all, that, all that harassing that you have when you're in the in the wilderness mm -hmm. has a deep psychological effect on the on the troops right, right. Uh, now we have uh, google maps and we always know where we are and uh, we have a tim martin not far uh, mcdonald gas yeah. stations but in these days it, it was just uh how can i say that uh opaque uh, that the, there was yeah. no yeah. Transparency. I think, we, I, I think we forget in, you know, certainly in Southern Ontario and probably upstate New York even, because we you know where that reenactment was done at Ticonderoga. I bet it, it it's very civilized now. Mm. You know, like it, it not, you know, at the time of the battle, it's this green, dense, coniferous yeah. jungle. Yeah. You know, and and it like you know these British soldiers like they get off the boat, they're sent up this 
you know, into the middle of this wilderness. They don't know what's going on. And it's, it's probably very, <clears throat> very disturbing to them. They're, they're used to like, you know, farmlands and villages and everything's yeah. closed in and there's black flies and mosquitoes that carry you off. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, it must've just been, yeah. Then, then you you see, you hear some Indians shouting in the woods and the mail hasn't got through and you're all, well, an hour fucked. Mm -hmm. You know, might as well just surrender <clears throat> you don't want to surrender because horrible, <laughs> horrible things will happen if you do yeah yeah no that's fat. that's true and and you're right you can win a battle in that in in the game by you know even indian even even like light troops can still roll flags right if you get enough flags yeah, <clears throat> yeah. so fl flag is good the uh, good things happening in uh, battle yeah exactly yeah yeah um, yeah, I, I did a little bit of American Civil War reenacting. Uh, I, I haven't done it for years, but I found it really, it was helpful for me in terms of understanding what it's like to move and fight in formation, right? It, it yeah. taught me a lot about how difficult command and control on the battlefield is. Mm. And, and, you know, and the, most of the fighting that we did, the fighting was, we was, you know, on open fields, but we did a, a, a tactical event once where we went into some woods, sort of very much like the Battle of the Wilderness in 1860. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was horrible. Yeah. You know, and one of the things that I, I actually remember this very clearly, that we we saw a bunch of guys on our right, and we formed up alongside them because we thought they were Union, and then we all started looking at each other, and I thought, holy crap, those are Rebs, and they were all looking at us like, oh, you're Union. Yes. But that actually happened, right? That yeah. because of the, as James said, you're fighting basically. You're fighting in a jungle. It's it's yeah, yeah. And 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 one of my uh, colleagues, I don't know if you know about uh, Jerry White uh, with his uh, Atlantic Chase War game. Yes. I have the game. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, it's based on the assumption that you don't even know where your your own side is. In right. these days, wow! So yeah. even in the 1940s, they had plotting room rooms. They they knew the ship was there, yeah. uh, it signaled there last time. It's headed that way, but we don't know where it is. Yeah, yeah. we try to intercept the Bismarck that way. The, this guy Jerry, he did a masterpiece, and his first inspiration was to cover a civil war event mm. where there was a a brigade, a union brigade that was supposed to be someplace, but it wasn't, and the commanding general didn't know, and he, he started from that. He said, yeah. I want the system to do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's one of the advantages that sometimes board games have over um, the miniature games is that, you know, by the time you get to the, to the tabletop level, um you pretty much know where everybody is right yeah 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 um, you you can add a layer of rules to simulate that you don't see i i had a very uh detailed uh tank uh tank miniature gaming system and and you have uh, like 10 pages of spotting rules uh with like uh, 30 modifiers but yeah. it this hampers uh, the game. So it better go with, uh, okay, we all see each other. Let's shoot. Let's have fun. Mm, absolutely. Well, fun, uh, abstracted fun, because in real life, it's not so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The closest I came to the real life feeling, feeling, uh, because I, I, I didn't serve uh, in the army. Uh, Contrary to many uh, American uh, friends uh, in the war game industry, mm -hmm. um, I have uh, a great uncle dead in uh, Nor Normandy. Mm. But uh, we were in Ticonderoga and we were uh, simulating uh, the the ambush that killed uh, Lord Howe and that demoralized demoralized the whole British army. Mm -hmm. And we were in the woods, we walked for maybe half an hour. And at one point, we have guys, green guys, they're rangers, and, and they're far, they're far at first. So you shoot, you shoot, but then they come closer. 
And there is one point where you have the feeling that if the guy sprints, he will get to you. And then you have a shiver and and I, I turned I, I turned back, I retreated. Yeah. And I said, wow, okay. It was just simulated and I felt that. And uh, so, so uh, yeah, it's, uh, wow. it's something. Yeah. Something. Oh. Oh. That was my best uh, reenactment. Uh, on another, wow. uh, the, yeah. the, the following day, I, <laughs> I jumped out of the main line and I, and I brought uh, British prisoners. <laughs> and I, and and the, our line was uh, that that was very bad on the security wise. Uh, fire was starting because there was straw. Yes. Uh, yeah. At our uh, at our feet, and uh, the guy beside me, he was a rookie, was quite careless. And, and then fire is starting. And you know, we have black powder and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had Yikes. to put out the fire, jump the fence, go fetch a prisoner. <laughs> it was a great day. Wow, yeah. It's it's amazing, actually, more people aren't hurt reenacting because it's, yeah, it, it's, you, you can get, people kind of get excited sometimes and mistakes happen and, yeah. Uh, well, they they work uh, really hard. Uh, yeah, yeah. For, for that, that, there are lots of regulation, and th this what I described was really uh, an exception, and the yeah. guy shouldn't have been there, and uh, I was watching him. But yeah. uh, uh, like on the plains of Abraham, uh, uh, the security is so strict. Uh, we have to hand out our powder until next morning. Uh, yes. yeah. Uh, yeah. Th there are no face-to-face -face shooting, and uh, yeah. so it's just shooting demonstration. So no, they they don't. Uh, uh, that that's one thing that amazed me and. Uh, the, uh, the, that I have respect for that uh, hobby and organization is that yeah. Yeah. they don't yeah. want nobody to get hurt. We're no. not in uh, Eastern Europe with those uh, medieval battles. Uh, uh, each other right. with, with steel. Yeah. 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 You come back, oh, sorry, darling, I lost an arm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I, I'm, I'm a range safety officer for the cadets, and it's just like, yeah, like you know, the nightmare of trying to do with people moving around, and and then you've got an audience, and there are and there are people that are going to move, you know, move onto the range to try and get a picture, because yeah. you know, they're not shooting real bullets, so it's like, no, oh, you can still get hurt, get out of the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the the cone of fire, it's very yeah, because like, people are stupid. You you can get death, yeah. yeah. Or you know, you get you get hit because there's still like you're still loading a cartridge and there's still something coming out, right? You know, the shock wave. Yeah. yeah. You know, so you 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 know, some moron with a camera could get very badly hurt if they yeah. walk in front of a firing line. It's like there was an actor. Uh, he died that way. He had the blank, uh, and he, he, he yeah. shot. Yes. It yeah. was in the eighties, I think. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so the the shock wave. Yeah, I, I was at an American event uh, on somebody's private land where where somebody got hit with a, a ramrod. They, oh, uh, yeah. one of the rules is you never you never um, touch your ramrod if you're if you're yeah. doing a demonstration. But some guys just think it's cool to be like you know ramming there, and then you know they forget that it's in the musket. And one guy got one through his arm. It was. Ouch. It, but American events, um, private land in the '90s were just they were crazy mm -hmm. but it's very different if you're working with parks canada or with the american park service that's just very professional yeah yeah well, that's that's but e even in each uh, in each troop like my troop but yeah. others like uh, uh many uh, all the groups i know uh the officers <clears throat> they are in charge of the security they they have a moral res responsibility, and oh, it adds to their chores. And uh, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, 
Yeah, it's much easier just to be a private and just show up. So, so they don't get to be officer just because they can afford the fancy uniform. They actually have responsibilities. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I, I met one or two posers. Uh, yeah, much, yeah. But, uh, they're, they're, they're the exception. They're there the are exception. some of those for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mark, what are you, uh, what are you working on now? Do you, or do you have another game that you're thinking about doing, or? I have. Uh, Two projects that are fairly advanced. One is a, a sequel to Atlantic Chase. It's oh, yeah. the Pacific War. So I expanded yeah. on that game to to cover the the aircraft carrier war, which right. is very uh, I'm intrigued. Uh, simplified in uh, Atlantic Chase because uh, uh, aircraft carriers in that theater were not as powerful mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, <clears throat> it was uh, i presented it to jerry white the author of the game uh, <laughs> he was crazy about it mm -hmm. uh, it he presented it to gmt they're crazy about it so they're just waiting this is good for me to 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 finish it mm -hmm. uh, which is another story and uh, <laughs> And because we don't do that for a living, eh? it doesn't right, right, right. doesn't pay the bills. And uh, at one yeah. point, when you work uh, several thousands of hours to to refine the game, uh, I I I'm not right now. I'm uh, I'm uh, in the pause, and I'm I'm uh, I'm not confident I, I can do that anymore. Uh, there are other things that I'd rather do with a thousand hours of free time. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, the other project, and it, it comes back to my uh, passion about World War II tanks, uh, which fascinate me since I'm five year old, I think. I, I, I saw a drawing that my mother kept, very crude drawing and uh, <laughs> it's the, the mother of all tanks on that drawing. <laughs> So uh, <clears throat> I, I have a system, a game that's called uh, Steel Platoons. And uh, it's, it's the opposite of uh, Panzer. It's uh, very, uh, very simplified, but still you have the enough realism in it so that uh, what happened is not, uh, is not uh, like, world of tanks <laughs> to name uh, uh, so, so something that dominates uh, but uh, and this one there's a French publisher that uh, that is interested uh, very much uh, and they're waiting for me also um, so we'll see if, uh, I, since last November it became it became harder for me to motivate myself. So uh, in January, I said, "Okay, take take a break, yeah. uh, come back to it when you feel like it, uh, or don't." And, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm I'm quite uh, content. the 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 game uh, the game about tanks. It's uh, I, I want to get the feeling of the the tiger skirmish in uh, in uh, uh, the Fury. movie with Brad Pitt, Fury. Oh yes, Fury, right, so, right. So, so that's the feeling of my game, mm. uh, and it it achieves it because I I presented it twice in convention, and people are like, uh, when is it gonna be published? Oh, okay. When is it gonna be published? Yeah. And again, as I'm a graphic designer it it looks good i have nice tank counters i i wanted to give that game a miniature feel like james you said uh, before where when you saw first uh, war games with just a nato symbol and number in the uh, arial <laughs> type yeah uh, it, it's a turn off so so uh, i I love miniatures, and uh, so I wanted that feeling in the game. Mm. So what kind of miniatures games do you play? Well, um, I, I 
I played some uh, micro armor, okay. but with the uh, home rules. So I have a huge box of micro armor. Uh, I, I really love that scale because uh, you you can have many tanks and uh, so uh, so that's what I played mostly. Uh, and for the rest, I uh, I dreamed of. <laughs> doing miniature gaming but i don't have the the time or the patience to uh to paint uh, armies but i'm uh i make models uh, i made a lot of uh, world war ii models and uh, dioramas and uh, things like that so the the father of uh, steel platoons was uh, a miniature game that 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 uh a miniature game that I uh, designed from, uh, you might know the rules, uh, Firefly, uh, so World, War II, uh, yeah. World, War, World War II tank tactical. So it's, uh, it was a crossover of Firefly and some bits of Advent Squad Leader and, uh, okay. and, uh, and it, it, uh, it became fun when I, I found a unique uh, activation system where you, you place block and you set your order and the other one doesn't know what is your order, but uh, you don't know what flexibility of order you'll get. You, you draw for each tank okay. and you can either get a full command block, which gives you all the options, a limited command block that that you're like more hesitating and if you're really unlucky you have like a frozen block you you you, the, the, you just froze and you do nothing so you never know so you you can have your tiger in a perfect position and you draw a frozen block oh, not just the other you. guy he doesn't know it yeah, yeah there's there's some hesitation there's some noise yeah, confusion yeah. people don't react you know, you're shouting shoot and they're like, what you know like i can't hear you you know yeah. like I, so, I people that people that don't like friction it's like god like go out with some scouts or cadets or something where you're not under fire and just mm -hmm. try and get like 30 people to go do something on time yeah in the woods and it's incredibly frustrating that that's called logistics yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. um but but still it, it it explains friction so much yeah yeah you know, people are, oh why are my guys just sitting there it's like well oh, they they didn't hear the orders so somebody had to go to the bathroom so they're waiting for them they can't yeah. they you know they, they can't get the tank to start it's stalled you know like they're you know. waiting for orders yeah the, the radio uh yeah, it was good yeah they, like they well. you you sent the order but it was garbled when they heard it and they're like what yeah. You know, there's that a, there's that famous account by a British tank commander in the desert. He's in one of those big um, Grant. Builder? No, it was a Grant tank. You know the the oh, really yeah. ones. Yeah. And he's like, he said, you know, this is what it's like commanding a tank. You know, you've got the 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 turret is traversing, but you don't want it to traverse. The driver is reversing, and you don't want him to reverse. You're trying to fix something, and you and somebody's trying to get somebody on the radio, and meanwhile somebody is handing you a sandwich. Right. And it's like, yeah, I was just, yeah, just like, yeah. Here. So, no, that sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, and it's a neat mechanic. Yeah. Yeah. And um, thanks. Yeah. It, it would be the, I think there's a lot of games uh, right now uh, that uh, are trying to do that in the miniatures level. So, James and I have played, James more than I have, have played a game by Richard Clark. Uh, what a tanker yeah okay. which which has sort of individual tanks uh it's like a tank on tank two or three tanks against two or three tanks primarily oh and that's perfect i think they're a lot more fun than those games like flames of war where you have 27 tigers all like side by side all this you know it's because those yeah. are kind of ridiculous yeah. yeah then our list is the sweet spot yeah, yeah for sure so, uh, Mark, I, as we finish, I, I was going to ask you a question that, that we ask all our guests, which is about being a Canadian war gamer, right? So our podcast is called The Canadian War Gamer because we felt that 
there wasn't really a podcast for for Canadians doing in our hobby. And you know, one of the questions that we ask people is, do you think of yourself as a as a Canadian war gamer? That is somebody who's really interested in war gaming as a Canadian, or just a war gamer who likes war games who just happens to live in Canada. And when you were telling me that you're telling us about your new projects, I, I I thought I was expecting to hear you were doing more like Canadian military hub, but now you're doing the Pacific and you're doing tanks. No, 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 no. Uh, I, for for uh, steel platoons, the focus is on the Canadians. I oh, forgot okay. to say that. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Radley, Radley Walters, and uh, yeah. yeah I, 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 I love the Sherbrooke Fusilier. My my father yeah. is from uh, Sherbrooke. Right. Uh, he didn't serve in that regiment, but uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, no, no, no. Uh, that's the the unique touch about uh, about uh, my game is that I I want to represent like the Afro American units, uh, the Free French, uh, yeah. the Canadians, all all these guys that are less represented. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. And so uh, it, it's hard to answer your question because at first I'd say that I'd be in France or in the United States or in Canada. Uh, I'd be a war gamer, but I, I love the... We have a different perspective. Uh, we... we we're not a country that that dominates the world so it it brings uh i think it it, it brings a different uh uh sensitivity to 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 uh, other realities other factions and uh, mm. so uh because even in the british army we were like bulldozed the uh, we were uh, like uh, sub uh, sub citizen, I, and I'm talking about the whole Canadians, not just mm -hmm. Quebec. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, we're just under Empire and Commonwealth. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. The the there are the real British from Britain and the others, the the Aussie, the new the Kiwis, uh, and us, mm -hmm. the Canucks. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so. Uh, I, I love the perspective of being a Canadian. It, 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 uh, we have really an interesting destiny. Yeah, yeah. Numbers wise, uh, we're beginning to look like new friends <laughs> against the US. Yes. Yeah, yeah. but, but well, we've been for, from a long time, even in 1812. Uh, we should have been bulldozed, but. Uh, they they, 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 they they were mismanaged uh, yes well uh, yeah. logistics again right yeah 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 uh, so so canada for me is a uh, is a little miracle uh, quebec is a little miracle so uh, let's enjoy our uh, pieces of land <laughs> yeah that's lovely thank you uh, so finally uh, we have uh, a tradition where we ask our guests to um, uh give us the titles of a couple of books that are dear to them that we uh and one of these days james i i really need to sit down and type out a list of all the books that our guests have recommended to us mm. okay so to go through all the pod notes yeah so um mark what what two or three titles would you like to uh, sort of symbolically give to us for our library um well First, uh, we have Peter MacLeod, who is uh, a great Canadian author. And uh, I have here Backs to the Wall, which is the, the siege of uh, the second siege of Quebec by the French after wow. they were beaten at the Plains of Abraham. And wait, sorry, wait a minute. There was a, there was a siege of Quebec by the French. Yeah, yeah in after. 1760. Why don't I know that? And, and they won, and they, the British waited, both sides waited for a fleet. Yeah. And guess whose fleet showed out, out up first? Ooh. So uh, the French retreated to Montreal, and uh, then it was toast. Um, so uh, there's a sister book to that, but I lent it to a good friend. It's Northern Armageddon. And that's the one, that's the one you have to read. It's 
it's perfect. And Peter MacLeod is the is the director now of the Canadian War Museum. Oh, okay. And he covers the perspective of the indigenous nations, the French, the English, the American. It it is incredible. Uh, so he he he's a. Uh, He's my best author on the subject. Uh, like an important read. Yeah, I, I need to. I'm uh, astonished I don't know anything about him. And uh, on the other hand, uh, Wilderness War. Uh, sorry, Crucible of War. Yeah. My friend Fred Anderson. It, it's quite a read that uh, I think 700 pages. But it's it's the Bible of the French and Indian War. Oh goodness! That, so that's the second one, and the third one. Well, I have quite a bunch, but it's Braddock's defeat. And when I saw that book in uh, in Maine in a in a bookshop I loved, I said, "Ah, oh, no, no, not another book on Braddock's defeat, but." That one is the only one that should have been written. It's, <laughs> it's by David Preston. Uh, and it, it, it re-inspects both sides. And it, it, uh, it, uh, for one, everybody, everybody says uh, Braddock is a moron, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that is uh, American revolutionary propaganda. Okay. Uh, uh, in fact, he was quite a capable general. Uh, so that book, uh, it looks at both sides, the French, the British, in, in lots of detail with lots of documentation we didn't have before. So these are my, my top three. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I, I've got a really dumb question. Well, actually, to, I feel, first of all, I really feel stupid that I didn't know about the siege of Quebec in 1760. So. Uh, nobody does, even me, before I, I digged a little, because he, yeah. he, um, the, the Quebec victory is the superstar yeah. of victories in, in the British Empire. So the, the, the victory that, that came afterwards, uh, first, it, it's to no avail. It didn't change nothing. Yeah. So it's just uh, it's just forgotten in the past. And even more interesting is that in 1762, so two years after the fall of New France, guess mm -hmm. what island the French seized? Newfoundland. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, they yeah. seized the Saint John. Yeah. And then the British were caught with their pants down, but. It took them uh, a few months and they took it back. But that's what gave the French the, the bargaining chip to, uh, to keep the fisheries of, uh, of Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which was pretty strategic. And I guess the other dumb question I had was, um, so the Ticonderoga, is that the battle that's portrayed in The Last of the Mohicans? Uh, no, no, it's the siege of uh, Fort William Henry. Oh, okay. Because yeah. uh, it's been a long time since I've seen the film, but isn't there a scene where the British are in the forest and they just get massacred? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, there is a skirmish at the... Oh, uh, yeah, when they, uh, when they surrender the fort and, and they go, that there was, there was a massacre. Okay. Uh, but uh, then again, it's another story that is uh, blown out of proportion. Right. Uh, the French did their utmost to uh, to protect the, the 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 British prisoners, but it was a conflict of indigenous vision of war and European vision of war. The, there's a very good. Uh, it summarized very good in uh, the war that made America. It's a short mini series by PBS. Very good if you can get your hands on that, uh, and you 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 learn quite a few things about the French and Indian War. Oh, okay. Oh.
I know you know not only books, but the war that made America, it's a really neat little story. Okay, I'll have a look for it. PBS. Okay, War that Made America. All right. Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. You're, you're, um, uh, so just for the record, for our listeners who might be interested in buying a, your game, Bayonets and Tomahawks, I understand right now, is waiting for its second printing. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah. So it's in something that GMT calls the P500 Club, which is you basically, um, it's like Kickstarter. You tell GMT you want the game, you give them your credit card, and then once they have 500 orders, then they'll 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 commit to doing a print run of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then they'll charge. Any way to do it? Yeah. So I would encourage our listeners, if you're a miniatures gamer but you're interested in a really really good playable uh, game that'll teach you about um, French and Indian War, I'd really encourage you to check that out. So, Mark, thank you so much. It's been a real real pleasure talking to you, and and uh, yeah. I hope uh, we'll we'll check in with you down the road and see what you're up to. And well, I, I, I listened to your uh, podcast to see. Uh, I, I I miss them, so I'm curious what you said about the game. And uh, James and uh, Michael, it was a pleasure chatting with you, uh, seeing a bit of Collingwood again. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're you're always welcome to come to Ontario, and especially in March when we have our hot lead. Uh, uh, yes. convention in a couple of weeks so oh yeah, yeah. always uh, always just before easter so okay all right. all right thank you we'll say good night to you and, and james and i will stay on and finish the podcast so yeah. thank you very much all right thank you very much uh, okay. Well, FC. You. okay good evening good evening All right. Oh, James, that was fantastic. Yeah, we'll have to hook him up with uh, Pierre Eve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's our second, uh, our second Quebecois guest. That's right. So, yeah, I, I really, uh, I, like, I'm a big fan of of Mark's game. It's, uh, it's fun. It's easy. It's, you know, it's super strategic. Like you're moving fleets around. You're deciding if you're going to attack Quebec or, you know, if you're going to raid Albany or whatever. But, but it's like I think there's a ton of potential interfaces yeah, where it's always like the, you can put it on the table so it's also struck me as you're operating on like either the huge strategic level mm -hmm. or you're thinking about the entire theater of war yeah and then you're worried about you know like 20 rangers and some indigenous allies out in the woods yeah yeah backing a fort yep yep and like there's nothing in between <laughs> <laughs> What's like, you know, like there's a couple of sort of operational level you know like louisburg quebec yeah yeah and you can decide if you want to as the british if you want to like you know because there's only a couple of ways to get into uh new france right you can come down the river right come down the river or if you want to be stupid you can try to hack your way you know overland but yeah, like that. You have to be prepared to build roads, and it takes that would only work in the campaign game. So yeah, it's fun. All right, um, we have a few minutes left, and there's a few things we wanted to talk about. Um, Hot light is coming up in two weeks. Yes, Ooh. yes, week, the weekend after this one, end of the month, twenty uh, third, twenty fourth, twenty fifth. Yeah. Um, it's been very like actually. Um, it's been very like all the pre-registration, like all the game masters signed up super fast. I had people come and say, Hey, I want, and that's, I'm sorry, I have no tables left. I'm full. Um, Cause I think everybody's so excited and there's a bit of, you know, uh, FOMO going on uh, fear of missing out for those of you who aren't down with what the kids say in the street. Yeah. We're and, in. you know, and the pre-registration for the games uh, took off really fast too. So it's been quiet for like two weeks. You know, I've, I've done with, dealt with a couple little emails, um, you know, people having to make their apologies and drop out and changing things around. But it's very little, you know, I haven't had anything to do for Hot Lead for like a week. Mm -hmm. It's been amazing. Mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, it's going to be exciting. Um, there's going to be a ADLG tournament, a, a DBA tournament, a bolt action tournament. Uh, every table is full 
Friday night right through to Saturday afternoon. There's something going on. And even Friday, even Saturday night has a good slate of games. So we have everything except cavemen. Except cavemen. Yeah. You want Roman chariot racing? We've got it. You want um, Saturday morning cartoon superheroes bashing each other? We have that too. Wow. We have pirate teddy bears. <laughs> We also have very serious, you know, Brian Hall's bringing a six millimeter, you know, very detailed scenario of a historical action. And then, you know, we have science fiction stuff and we got some fantasy stuff and it, it's, dude, we got done. It's going to be great. It's going to be huge. I wasn't, I wasn't able to pre-register for Keith Burnett's uh, Leipzig game. So I'm really hoping to, I can steal my way into that. Well, I mean, all the all the participation games are holding back twenty five percent of the slots. Yeah, for signing up in person. Um, the the role playing games and the tournament games, uh, you know, we want one hundred percent sign up just to make sure they run. Mm -hmm. But you know, so, uh, but yeah, for the open participation games, it's still there's still some some spots left. So if you get in the line and beat them, beat someone there, you can put your name down. Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. Yeah, like even if nothing else, I'll just watch it. Yeah, I've I've never been able, I've never gotten a chance to play with Keith's Blucher stuff. It always looks cool. Yeah. And but you know, whenever he's done one, I've always had to leave before he puts that game on, or I haven't been able to make it, or it's like that. I knew things were trending well when I tried to uh, book into the uh, uh, the hotel and discovered it was full. Yes. So my wife and I are going to stay at the Bruce. Right next door. Right next door, and the Bruce seems like a pretty shishi kind of hotel, and it's very bougie. My wife is all about bougie, so yeah, yeah, there you go. yeah. So yeah. she's like, I get to stay in a nice hotel for two days and do whatever I want, and go shopping in Stratford. Yeah, this is great, honey. So yeah, there's some nice shops downtown. I'm a hero. Yeah, I'm a hero. Had a boy. Wait, take one for the team. So I want to talk a little bit about my tiny role in helping get ready for uh, Hot Lead. I I went over to our friend Joe Saunders. Mm -hmm last Tuesday and was play testing his sharp practice game. I, I put a couple of pictures on my blog because as usual, Joe does a nice table. Yeah. And uh, I have to say, this is the only time that I have actually ever played Napoleon on a, in a tactical game. Oh, yes. So if you want to play like the, the emperor himself on the table in 28 millimeter, getting shot at by Spanish partisans and doing cool shit, then this is the game for you. I, yeah, I mean, oh, how would he perform tactically? Like, is he a level two or a level four? Level, big man? level four. He's a level four big man. He's the biggest he's like, of big men. He is like a god on the table. So, yeah. yeah, he can like activate three units and activate his own unit. And it's just like, yeah. Well, it's just, yeah, like his escort is like the chasseurs of the guard. So, mm -hmm. yeah. However, in the, in the game, we decided that um, it might be a bad idea giving both sides a unit of shock cavalry because have the impact cavalry because um, uh, he lined up his uh, his blues and royals and just like charged down the street of this um, little Spanish village and basically just steamrollered poor Napoleon. So uh, who was was last seen being carried unconscious off the field. So yeah, by some drunken British troopers. <laughs> oh dear. No, I think I think the survivors of his chasseurs carried him off. But oh okay. Anyway, uh, that looked that was a, a fun game uh, to play test, and Joe bring, Joe brings his usual standard to uh, to the tables. Well, that's good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm excited, and I have the whole weekend off, so I'm looking forward to being there. And yeah. we'll do a uh, we'll do a little uh, hot lead wrap up afterwards for the podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, I noticed when uh, our friend uh, Mark was talking about his carrier game, uh, your eyes kind of lit up a little bit because you just got uh, Sam most of his Nimitz in the mail. Yes, um, that was kind of neat. I ordered like, you know, I sort of humming and hawing and then somebody talked about, you know, on, the, on Facebook, they talked about the game and the game they played. Like, He's, they're playing like with cruisers and destroyers. It's what I want to do. And so I'm sold. And um yeah, so I ordered it on on Saturday, and the Amazon guy showed up on Monday. Like, because it's he's doing um, through. If you want a physical copy, it he does it like print on demand through Amazon. 
Mm -hmm. So it's local, it's domestic shipping, no matter where in the world you're ordering it from, which is kind of cool. Uh, yeah, so I've been reading it in my, in my lunch breaks at work, and um, it seems really neat. I'm hoping, I mean, with all ship games, you've got to make up, you know, the data cards, track damage and stuff for all your ships. Right. So that's going to be a sort of pre-administrative burden, which is a little annoying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I won't be able to get a game together until after Hotlet, I don't think. Right. Because um, the computer is going to be tied up printing off sign up sheets and stuff uh and that that is the one thing that bugs me about ship games is the data cards and all this you know pre-game admin you've got to do you can't just you can't just say hey let's play nimitz tonight and throw down some fleets unless you've already got the sheets made up right, right. So i think i think i'm just gonna, gonna have to make up a couple of you know a couple of roughly balanced squadrons of of or fleets of ships and just like pre-print the sheets so that way i can just have them in the book and you know somebody say hey let's play them it's a like, cool uh do you want japanese squadron a or japanese squadron b take your pick they're all the same yeah they're, yeah. they're all the same points you know so yeah they're sort of super generic but it, but it looks promising um he, he's you know, i listened to his podcast and you know he he's his ideas about how trying to streamline you know, like obviously you have to have some technical crunchiness for ships because, you know, it's like the technology bashing each other is very important. Um, but he doesn't get too crazy about, you know, I have a 16 inch gun and you've got a 15 inch gun. It's like, no, you both have big guns, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, it seems neat. I'm, I'm very excited. I'm hoping to get all those ships I painted last year on the table and playing. So. Yeah, I might. Uh, I might even paint some myself. I'm. Yeah, uh, since you have the files. I was pleased to note that um, uh, a, a guy that I follow in Australia uh, has a blog called The Stronghold Rebuilt. He calls himself Captain Cobalt. Actually, yes. I actually met him when I was there in 2019, but I'm blanking oh, yeah. on his name right now. Anyway, he um, he was one of the playtesters for Nimitz. Yes, he helped sell me on the game too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he said a lot of the a lot of the game a lot of the playtest games they played were like destroyer and cruiser actions, mm -hmm. and it's like that's perfect. That's the scale I want to get at. Because I found with Victory at Sea, it was very much um, battleships. It was very battleship and you know heavy cruiser focused. Mm -hmm. uh, destroyers, even even destroyers shooting at each other, they might as well have just been throwing marshmallows. Really? Yeah, like it was. Just, uh, maybe I was playing it wrong. But it seemed that destroyers, like once they launched their torpedoes, they weren't really, they couldn't do anything. Mm. You know, so Which is so funny they handled torpedoes is weird. So. In a couple of podcasts ago, I was talking about that American book, um, Last of the Tin Can Sailors, right? Yep. About the, the, that battle in the Lake of Gulf where, yeah. uh, you know, the, the American destroyers actually uh, went racing into, uh, you know, pester the, these Japanese heavy cruisers and battleships with their rapid firing five inch guns mm -hmm. and were able basically to, to seriously damage and distract them just by the volume of fire, right? Yeah. So you've got five inch shells hitting your superstructure that's going to kill your bridge crews. It's going to kill your spotters. It's going to oh, knock, yeah. knock out yeah, your like the, in, um, Oh, it was in the, it was in the slot. Right, one of the battles around Guadalcanal, and yeah, and the the yeah the American destroyers got up against um one of the, it was one of the Congo class battle cruisers. So it's a big boat. Yes, yeah, terrible. And, and and they knew we can't penetrate their hull armor, and so yeah, they they just took the, their five inch guns and they just chewed the crap out of everything above the deck. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so like these, 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 you know, these ships aren't aren't sinking, but they're flaming hulks. <laughs> just right, right. trash. They've lost all their command and control, communications, everything. You yeah, know, it's like they're just they're they're floating fires. Yeah, um, it's just never a good thing to be. Yeah, because these the like American destroyer commanders just like they were incredibly gutsy young men. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh my God, you did not become a destroyer captain if you were at all like shy <laughs> right right yeah and in this book tin can sailors there's even like a hierarchy right so 
there, there's destroyers, but then there's destroyer escorts. And the destroyer escorts were like Napoleonic, like cavalry. Yeah. Like they were full of themselves. Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. Well, I mean, you know, like, uh, you know, the um, Polish destroyer that found the Bismarck. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. The I am. Right? A... And they, they, they run the, they run the signal of saying, we are a pole. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Fuck you, Nazi bastards! Yeah. <laughs> and they're just doing their best, you know. It's like, yeah. man, if if they if they hit you with one of their shells, you are dead, and they don't care. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we are going to we are going to hang off your coattail until the rest of the Royal Navy shows up and sinks your Nazi ass. That's right, exactly. Yeah, and it's like God, Nick. Just man, I I just got nothing but admiration for those guys. I know it's it's crazy. Yeah. So yeah. the and the other thing I've been distracted about is um, Xenos Rampant. Yes, Xenos Rampant. Everyone is talking about it. It is the hot new game. All the cool kids are playing it. Why have I not ordered a copy of it? So so give us your uh, your initial thoughts, buddy. Well, like at first, I I was sort of I was hesitant because like oh you know it's a, it's you know the big book you know hardcover format like if it was a blue book I would have I would have ordered it like months ago as soon as it came out right so it's not a it's not an Osprey blue book it's uh... no no it's see it's it's the big hardcover you know it's like it's like um, Stargrave Frostgrave right Rampant Second Edition so it's you know like I don't know uh, whatever thirty pounds forty pounds mm -hmm. uh, Canadian forty seven dollars. UK 25 pounds. So it's like you know, twice the price. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's a ton of fun. It's breathed new life into my science fiction stuff. Yeah. Which has been sitting basically since we, you know, we fought the epic battle of Kitty Glitter 4. Yes. Yeah. And you know what? I was looking at my space kitties the other day thinking. Your space kitties can have fun with these. Yeah. Because you can get them, the, you can give them the close combat doctrine. Yeah. And make yeah. them very pouncy right right um yeah so it, it's it's like line rampant dragon rampant you know you have basic troop types and then you can you can customize them with upgrades mm -hmm. and it's, it's sort of interesting in that um you know the same like there's a lead infantry uh which are you know small heavily armored very expensive you know they're basically your guys in power armor mm -hmm. and then there's you know the heavy infantry and light infantry which you know but they start at a much lower points value because he, I think he's assuming that you're going to be adding upgrades to make them special, you know, you heavy weapons or anti-tank or whatever. And then that will bring the price up. Like I had a, I had a, a little uh, scout team, mm -hmm. you know, um, they're scouts, you know, one point. And then I gave them the sniper ability so they could shoot further. And I gave them um, uh, fire support so they could call in, basically calling in fire missions from orbit. And suddenly they're like a nine point unit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like, they're the most expensive guys in the table. Uh, they, yeah. they did drop a fire mission on some, some OPA inserts, right. and, you know. Well, you know, if you're, guys. If you're talking to a battle cruiser in orbit, suddenly you're, you're, yeah, you're pretty valuable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, so it's very cool. Um, yeah. I, I've been like, I've been mucking about making terrain. I've been, um, I'll show you. I had the inspiration because my, my OPA need, if anyone doesn't watch the expanse, watch the expanse and you know what I'm talking about. Um, but they need more men, right? right. Like barely scrape together, like even with giving them upgrades and stuff, like unless they give them stupid upgrades, which wouldn't make sense for the background. Um, I can barely scrape together like 25 points for them. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. art, you know, my Martian force can squish them like a bug. So that, you know what? I'm going to make them drones. Oh, okay. So um, I'm got, I've, so I, so I made like a couple of units of drones out of pieces of sprue, mm -hmm. right? That's a piece of sprue with some bits stuck on it. You know, like this guy's got a couple of, you know, I uh, think that's, that's the support for Browning 30 Cal and mm -hmm. I don't know, something the return, the, the arms that hold the return roller on the front of an M3 looks like right. that. And then these little weird colored things. I was gonna are, say colorful are called bling stickers, bling stickers from the scrapbooking section right 
in your in your in your Michaels. I got them to put you now basically greebles on the hulls of spaceships I was planning on scratch building. Right. And I thought, you know what, I'll put these on the, you know, sort of like whatever panels or stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh yeah, so here's another one with a uh Russian or cut down Russian 57 millimeter anti-tank gun. Okay. You know, it's, like a, it's a grenade launcher or something. Right. Um, so they, they will be they will be lesser xenos with mm -hmm. um I'll give them the mechanoid rule so they won't have the wild charge because that'd be silly for drones. Right. I'll give them skimmer and some other stuff, heavy, heavy weapons or something like that. Um, so yeah, they're they're gonna be like little swarms of drones to replace infantry units. Yeah. You know, because I figure that's you know, that's what I'd do if I was an insurgent. I'd sure. make Absolutely. drones and go attack the you know colonial colonialist oppressor oppressors. Right. right well, which which we see happening in the Ukraine right now, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like Ukraine and there's that other um fight. Where was that? Um Moldovia? Mm -hmm. One of the one of the Russian Kazakhstan. Azer, uh, was that, sorry, that was uh, Azerbaijan uh, Armenia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where like drones were just, you know, and they're they're catching like armored columns and passes and you know. Yeah, the Armenians took a pounding from drones. Yeah. So no a couple of questions about Xenos Rampant. Um, first of all, does it feel like the other rampant games? Yes. It okay. Does. So easy to pick up. Easy to pick up. Another neat thing is that some of the troops have free activations. Okay. Right. So um, heavy infantry, they can shoot for free. Okay. So to move, you have to roll to activate. Light infantry, they move for free, but to shoot, you have to activate. Right. Sort of makes sense. And they both have what's the firefight rule where, um, you know, when they're shot at, they can roll to activate to shoot back. I mean, okay. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tougher activation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so even like heavy infantry that shoot for free uh, for the firefight, they still have to roll to activate to, mm -hmm. to return fire, which mm -hmm. is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, the elite infantry get two free activations. They can either assault or shoot. Mm. So that's neat. And tanks um can do like they can move for free and then roll to activate to shoot in the same turn oh. but if you fail the roll to activation to shoot then well of course you're done and the act you know the the initiative goes over the other player okay you know so you have to balance your free you know your free activations versus um you know getting what you want done mm. so. Hmm. Yeah, it's 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 very cool it's 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 you know i've been i've been making i made a box of a box of rocks because i realized my my gray cloth for you know jovian moons is too flat you need, you need like having cover for xenos rampant is good yeah i would think you know? so so go raid the artificial plants in the dollar store and make your weird alien jungle <laughs> make you know make rocks make you know whatever okay. um, alien terrain you want and the other question is um, the variety of alien species. Like, is it sort of generic? Like, you have, you said you mentioned you've got mechanoids. Have you got bugs? Like, um, oh. basically, you've got the different troop types, and okay. and you can flavor them. However, like there aren't alien species per se. Okay, right. right. So, you know, like you could make your space kitties. Um, you know, give them the close combat doctrine or okay. You know, um, yeah, the, the you know the greater and greater and lesser Xenos, kind of like the greater and lesser War Beasts and Dragon Rampant. Right, right. Um, except, yeah, you can you can change the flavor, like add the add the mechanoid rule, so they're like you know swarms of machines or or something, or, or swarms of bugs or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. or yeah, you know, um, just swarm. Yeah, there's 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 all kinds of there's all kinds of different rules in there that you can like change the flavor. Okay, cool. So, well, if I see a copy on sale uh, at Hot Light, I will buy them. Otherwise, I will um, probably order them. Because I, I think it sounds like something I should have. Yeah. Yeah. And then you know, your space kitties can live again. I, I really want to revisit that. So, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. We'll, um, 
we'll check in again when we, we both have our hands on those rules. Mm -hmm. uh, we should probably wrap this up fairly shortly, but uh, just a couple of things. Uh, you and I talked a little bit before we went on the air about 3D printing. So mm. just to say that 3D printing continues to confound me. I have really, really good days. I have really bad days where I just want to chuck it all in the sea. I showed you some of the Lucas Luber um, Alps of Flame figures that are, are coming. Very pretty. They are quite nice. So um, I'll probably work. I've got a bunch of Austrians that I think I will probably paint up because uh, I've been doing a lot of Austrians in six millimeter and um, they are kind of infectious. They're just, it's just a cool army. I, I suppose it is. It's a charming big, army. Big casks with the yeah. and stuff. And, but I, I'll, I have a lot of, I, you know, I, people, people like to dunk on the Austria. I mean, you know, you got the, you got the, the, the Napoleon camp where they, they dunk on everybody. Yeah. And then yeah. you have, you know, you have like the, the, you know, um, people that, you know, well, the Napoleonic Wars are basically the peninsula and the Waterloo campaign and we don't care about the rest. Yeah. You know, and they, they dunk on everyone who's not British or French. Yeah. And, and what did Napoleon say? He said, if you haven't, if you didn't fight the Austrians at Asper Nestling, you haven't fought anybody or something to that effect. Yes, because yeah. Yeah, there's a courtier dunking on the Austrians. And he said, you weren't at Asper Nestling. Yeah. So shut, shut up. up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't want Napoleon Bonaparte telling, telling me, putting me in my place. Thank you. And just here's a little story about, uh, how some things are sort of too good to be true. So because I've backed a couple of SDL um, Kickstarter projects, I, I get these emails every now and then, which I try to ignore. But I, I did that one and it said, hey, buddy, you could back a project called Riders of the Plains. And I looked at it because it kind of looked really Rohani. And it was all these uh, files for, you know, guys on horses with shields with you know, little horse insignias and, you know, gothic kind of style, style helmets and cloaks and um, hero figures and buildings and fortifications. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that. I, yeah. So I thought, oh, I should back that. So I backed it and it was like 60, 60 euros. So 110 bucks or whatever. Um, but then I got an email the other day from Kickstarter saying, Riders of the Plains is the subject of an intellectual property dispute. The project has been removed from public view pending dispute resolution. In other words, a bunch of lawyers from uh, either um, the Tolkien estate, the Tolkien estate or uh, whoever did uh, the Lord of the Rings movies or Games Workshop or some combination thereof have showed up on your doorstep like a bunch of angry Nazgul. So, yeah. So did anyway, you get your money back? Well, I haven't. Uh, I never paid any money because uh, you only get money. Uh, you only get charged if the project reaches its goal, right? Oh, okay. I thought you had to put the money in, and it was no. held. I, I thought the money was sort of held in trust. Right. No, and then I, if it launched, they kept the money and sent you product. Or no, it's exactly like what I was describing for when we were talking to Mark about what GMT does, right? Okay. You, you say, uh, "Here's my credit card number." They say, "Fine. If we get to a certain number of orders, then we'll charge it." And then that funds the project, but oh, in this okay. case, in this case, it was interesting. Inclined, I might be more inclined to back a Kickstarter now if that's how they work. You know, it's it's, it's always seems like voodoo to me. Yeah, well, it's just a question of you know how badly do you want it, and not really how likely is it to happen, right? So yeah. I, yeah. I backed the Kickstarter once where it never happened just because it was somebody was trying to make a an iPad game for three D or for Civil War Ironclads. And I think maybe me and two other people thought that was a cool idea. But anyway. Well, speaking, speaking of things Middle Earthy, I've also been, you know, because I'm not distracted enough with uh, World War II in the Pacific, um, you know, battling in the Jovian moons. I'm right. also, you know, I, right after Christmas, I ordered some archers for my dwarves from oh, yes. right. proper models. Right. And they, I got the email to, you know, oh, your order's filled. It's going to be shipped. And then that Russian cyber attack hit the oh, <laughs> mail. Oh. And my dwarf sat in limbo for like six weeks. They, uh -huh. showed up. they finally showed up, um, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but yeah, and around the same time, um, 
Yep. I was uh, William Hop of Thistle and Rose. He, he, he bought the Vendel line. Yes. And you know he he likes he likes the pictures I put up of the Vendel stuff that you know painted and and he's I've let him use some of my pictures um, for his you know promotional stuff on his Facebook and everything like that. That's, you mm -hmm. know, so he he said, "Hey, I'm getting some hobbits sculpted because the the original Vendel line only had like a little six pack. But That's right. Four, you know the four Hobbit adventurers." or halfling adventurers we can't call them hobbits so we're gonna get sued right um, halfling adventurers and then like a nice little vignette of frodo and and sam and a couple of rabbits and a pamper <laughs> and so he's he's got somebody to sculpt um like figures to make an army and he said would you like some and you know and i said well I'd, I'd love some I'll, I'll paint them up and take pictures and you can use those and that'd be great and he said well you know, I'll, you know and i'm thinking I'll, I'll get like you know half a dozen a dozen figures and i'll make a unit of skirmishers or something and they'll, they'll run around with elves it'll be fun no he sends me enough for an army Ooh. also i've got like a dozen um he's got he he's done hobbits he's done halflings throwing throwing rocks right which you know of course you have to have halflings throwing rocks there they are there's two of them okay and um, they come six to a pack. And he's done halflings with bows. Okay. You know, and there's like three, there's there's three different poses of each. Mm -hmm. And um, so this this what I've got painted up so far is the, you know, is the dozen, dozen, yeah. See the, the chap in the red shirt is one of the original Colin Patton sculpts. Okay. I'm using him as a as a leader. Um, and then he's done a um, a set of angry villagers. So they're they're in like there's some there's a chap in coveralls. There's a guy in like a, a you know big coat like he works in a mill or something. Um, and there's one who's obviously in like a frock coat with cuffs and you know pockets. So he's you know a well-to-do Bilbo type. Mm -hmm. And they've got an assort assorted you know pitchforks and axes and clubs and and then there's um, hobbits hobbits with spears uh, and they're like you know cloaks and spears you know light infantry running through the woods uh yeah so he sent me a dozen of each code so i've got like you know an unexpected army which is kind of cool yeah 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 so and and the um the archers the spearmen and the angry villagers all have separate weapon hands okay so you're like these little tiny hands with you know trying to put into a socket, which is which was interesting. I yeah. had to get you know a super glue accelerator to make sure things stuck. Yeah, yeah. Um, a little delicate. I'm you know sometimes wonder wonder about this the choice the sculptor made doing that. But I'm always afraid of the super glue accelerator. It's it's a lifesaver in these situations. Otherwise, you, this part drops off and then it bonds to your pants or whatever. Right, right. You know, um, never good. Yeah, so I've got the the other half of the hobbits um, queued up on the painting desk. When I stop doing things for Zeno's rampant, I'll get back to the Middle Earth. Um, okay, you know, and there we are. That's that's me. Okay, it's been pretty um, exciting. That is very exciting. I I would love to see those hobbits. So they're um they they would be compatible with like twenty eight millimeter figures. They're just like yes. small. Oh, yes, they're 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 um yeah they're they're lovely. They're actually they scale really well with um let's see, I'll show you here. Where is he? Okay, here. Yeah. Here is the um the I've got one of the games workshop Mary's. Yes, I I have that Mary. figure. Yeah, yep. you have that figure. Yeah. And so here is you know beside oh that works perfectly yeah 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 and you know what also these are 20 millimeter these are 172 scale people oh because you i remember last time we talked you were talking about doing the airfix robin hood figures as halflings yes and patrick um who gave you money he happened to have he, he bought a box because he saw it yeah and then he, he heard me nattering on and so he showed up after christmas said, here you go okay <laughs> so cool. that's gonna generate 
another unit of archers, some light infantry and, and skirmishers. And so like, I'm gonna there you go. easily have a 40 point army of halflings. That might be the army that allows you to recapture Smoochie the dragon. Maybe, we live in hope. We live in hope, cool. Well, as we wind down, it's, it's my turn to just do a little bit of show and tell. I, um, so we talked to, uh, we talked to uh, uh, Derek Jacoby from uh, uh, Six Squared. Yes. And uh, they are really, really busy with um, uh, whatever they're doing, their, their retail project and stuff. Mm -hmm. so I wish them success. One thing I, I did notice is that they, they were better in the past at doing custom MDF bases than they seem to be now. They just don't seem to have the bandwidth for it. Mm. So I said to myself, hello, where can I get custom MDF bases? And then I thought, war bases. So um, I, I like these 100 by 100 millimeter square bases because they're great for my six millimeter collection. I can bung two or three little buildings down and I've got a built up area. Yep. Built. So they came relatively quickly. So, you know, um, nothing, I'm not saying anything bad about six squared, but um, that you know, I would go elsewhere for custom made MDF right now. But they also had some of these little uh, scenic things. So these are little, they call them scenic tile pieces or, or something like that. Oh. And it's uh, at first, well, it's no, it's MDF. Like, so it's like a, I don't know. Yeah, but they printed a graphic on it. That's right. So they put a little graphic on. So this is a little field. Yeah. And there's a little, um, there's a little uh, stone fence around the edge of it and with a little gate. So you could put this down on your table if you just wanted to have like some scatter terrain. There's two small things here. You just pop them out of the sprue. And then there's also some little hedge, or some little ponds rather that I ordered as well. Um, I think I've seen the ponds. Yeah, I didn't realize that they had these little wall things printed on them. And I thought, you know, maybe for, for six millimeter or 15 millimeter, that might do, you know, like it just, it just provides a, a defined piece of terrain and it looks okay. And, you know, it, it's kind of like a compromise between 3D miniatures and 2D counters, right? It's, yeah. Which a lot, a lot of, there, there seems to be quite the market for that. Yeah. Yeah. For the want, the want the miniatures, but they also want the, the simplicity, ease of storage. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, the, you know, nice, nice, smooth, clean graphics or something that comes already printed. Yep. Yep. So I'm, I'm, I'm all about that. So anyway, all right. So that's our show and tell. I will see you in a couple of weeks of hot lead, which is super exciting. And I just want to, I just wanted to share a late breaking email from our friend, Mark. He just wrote to me. Oh, he said, I'll just read it for our listeners. Um, oh, it has a, it has a picture of it looks like his tank game. Oh, I will put these on the, I'll put these on the website. Yeah. Anyway, he says, I just want to emphasize how it was cool chatting with both of you. That's the power of our shared passion for games, miniatures, and history. For book recommendations, I limited myself to English titles because most of your listeners must be English speaking, say, say, Ray, uh, New Sommelier's Anglo in Durant. But here are two essential titles for French speakers. One is by Laurent Neriche, The Petit Guerre et la Chute de la Nouvelle France, a French military. So the, Little War and the Fall of New France. It blows away the myth of the French forest Rambos. Describes very well the capabilities and limitations of Canadian light troops by a French military analyst. The second is a book called Montcalm General American by Quebec historian David Noel. Like Preston's book, Braddock's Defeat does for the British general. It gives a more proper portrayal of how that French general was adapted to the North American theater. Hmm. And then he gives us some uh, photographs of the steel platoon's prototype. Notice the muzzle flash markers to indicate units that fired. That's what I mean by a real miniature feel. Uh, so, oh yeah, that's very, very cool. So I'll put those on our Facebook page, um, probably hopefully tomorrow or the weekend. So yeah. You're gonna flex that social media, man. You gotta flex that social media for sure. That's All right. Cool. All right, friends. Thank you so much for listening to us. We asked uh, Mark Rodrigue what his, um, his musical selection would be for our play out. And uh, he asked for Au Pré de Ma Blonde, which is not, I thought World, Au Pré de Ma Blonde was a World War uh, I piece, but he says no. 
It was the 18th century military march of French uh, Troupe de Marine. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will, uh, and actually I was listening to a really, really pretty recording of that the other day. So I'm going to try to find that and we'll include that in the podcast coming up next. All right. Well, thank you, James. I really enjoyed this. Thank you, Mark. Yes. And thank you out there uh, for listening. So just a, a final comment about the Canadian War Gamer podcast. We never ask you for money. We do this just because we're bored and we're <laughs> definitely not boring. So it gives us a chance to talk to each other. Exactly. We'll never ask you for money. We don't do uh, uh, Patreon. We don't do uh, Buy Me a Coffee, but we do respect those podcasts who do. So the other day I went on to uh, the website for our American friends, uh, anything but a one. Adventures in Historical Miniature Wargaming, and I gave them a few virtual bucks. Um, but uh, if you want, if you if you appreciate what we did, then just tell a friend and uh, give some money to some hungry uh, dude on the street or to the charity of your choice or adopt a dog or whatever it does. That That's right. There's so many good causes out there, especially right now. Especially right now. All right. Okay. Thank you, James. Thank you, listeners. All right. Bye-bye and bye, Bonds. My balls. All right. <laughs> Cheers. Bye.